Hello, everybody, and welcome to Unit 4, Resident Rights, all aka Patient Rights. Um, we'll get into the slight difference there in a minute, but it's essentially the same thing. It is important to note that within uh, geriatric care, there's a lot more emphasis on what does the patient want, what outcomes do they want. Obviously, that's always a weighted consideration. But there's much more emphasis on that versus what interventions would be best. The question is always, what does this person want first before anything else? But just as an overview here, and what is the difference somewhat? Uh, resident rights, all residents, when I mean, we're talking residents, we're talking uh, long-term care facility admission um, versus patient, which is a, someone in an acute care setting. So all residents have automatic delineated rights upon admission. For example, they have the right of informed consent and to refuse treatment options, and they have the right to privacy. A lot of these will feel pretty much like understood best practice. Uh, it's not like it's con uh, it's not a controversial statement to say that a resident or a patient has the right for, to informed consent. Um, but these are legally delineated as opposed to best standards in practice. So uh, why is this? Again, all patients have rights, but the difference is that in a long-term care facility specifically, which again is where many geriatric, a lot of geriatric health care happens in long-term care facilities, um, the facility is their home, right? They live there versus a hospital where you're there for a, an acute, finite amount of time, and then you, you leave, you go home. So the facility is their home, which changes things somewhat. You, know, you have just as much right to come in and sit down in their apartment and talk to them about, lecture them about how to live as much as I do to come into your home and do that. Right? So... That's the philosophical difference there is that they live in the facility, therefore care has to be taken to honor that their home and their privacy. Um, something to keep in mind here is uh, this is not an official thing. This is just something my friend came up with. I've always held on to it since then. It's Richard's rule, which is the amount of effort put into noting a rule is directly proportional to the amount of work countering people not following it. So anytime you see a posted sign or you see a regulation in place that's written out that seems incredibly stupidly obvious, what that tells you is enough people have not followed the rule or violated it such that the powers that be felt it was more worth their time to go through the effort of making it an actual regulation than just allowing common sense to take place. So when some of these seem ludicrous to you, remember that the reason that they are there is because people weren't doing it. So uh, resident rights statements. Um, this is, again, a legal statement. It is required to be posted in long-term care facilities along with the Resident Bill of Rights, which we'll get to in a little bit. So all residents have the right to dignified existence, self-determination, and communication and access to persons and services inside and outside the facility. So yeah, that is, I read that out as a quote that has to be posted by law in a facility. And this is the framework which we're going forward with, right? This, this, that statement is what all the rest of this is built upon. So a facility is required to create and maintain an environment that protects resident rights and allows as much independence as possible. I apologize, by the way, for this very... This is going to be a very word-dense presentation because there's a lot of quotations I'm pulling out here. Um, apologies, I really don't like to do that, but I, I felt it was important in this case. So where this comes from is that the, res the facility must provide equal access to all residents regardless of diagnosis, severity of condition, or payment source. And again, that's clearly delineated. These are, these are violations that you can get cited for in a facility if, if they are not followed. Um, the stated rights do not supersede rights as a U.S. citizen or citizen of their state. So you have your, 
the um, your constitutional rights as a U.S. citizen. If if you are a U.S. citizen, if you are from another country, I, I don't know how that works, but I assume you have something similar. Uh, and within the U.S., there are some states that have their own Bill of Rights. So you don't give up any of your rights as a citizen when you enter the facility. You have kind of more enumerated rights, again, because people were violating these rights in the past, and so now they are clearly set and regulated. So the facility may not interfere with, curtail, or coerce the free execution of resident rights, and they must promote said rights as much as possible. So it's not enough to just say you still have the right to, uh, to make your political opinions known. The facility has to make sure that the resident has the opportunity to do that, and they have to empower them as much as possible. Uh, another emphasis is quality of life, and again, I know, this seems very obvious. Of course, we care about quality of life, but, you know, again, people weren't doing it. So now it's a rule. And I mean, the good news is if you're doing a good job, it's fine. You don't have to worry about it. <laughs> but if you are not doing a good job, not you personally, the facility, best look out. And you probably shouldn't be in the business in the first place. So the facility must promote an environment that maintains or enhances the quality of life of a resident. And again, pulling from the documentation, they, are, uh, they must be treated with the fullest measure of dignity, consideration, and respect. How does this manifest? Uh, the facility is required to provide services and activities to the highest practical, physical, mental, and psychological well-being of each resident. So not only does the facility have to empower, say, again, uh, voting rights and voting ability, they have to provide activities, and they have to provide activities that are within the scope of somebody's capabilities. So they may have a book club, for example, pulling one that uh, one of my facilities has. They have a book club. That's great for high-functioning um, high individuals, but for people with advanced dementia, well, a book club is, is not a useful uh, activity. So they have then like coloring activities. Perfectly good for almost everybody. Maybe someone in the book club doesn't care for that, although I know plenty of people that are totally into coloring books. Uh, but everybody can do that. You can give them some uh, you know, some crayons or some markers or something, and, and everybody can do that. Most people at least. Dignity. Uh, and again, this... Um, I will tell you the pendulum kind of swings on what the regulation or regulators want to see. Dignity is very, very big right now. Uh, so everybody has to be treated with dignity and respect. How does this manifest in a facility? They are allowed to make their own schedule. For for you, for the, for the dietitians, what this does mean is they are, the facilities are required to have stated meals at stated times. So you must have breakfast at, say, 7.30. You have to post it at 7.30. You have to have it at 7.30. But the residents are under no obligation to go to breakfast. You know, maybe they don't want to. I probably would not want to get up and have breakfast at 7.30. I'm not much of a morning person. So in a case like that, I, I'm not going. <laughs> and that's fine. You have, they have, you have to have the breakfast, but also you have to allow each individual to make their own schedule. Uh, they have to be allowed to live as independently as possible with the minimum amount of assistance necessary for safety. And again, they have to be treated the same regardless of diagnosis, severity of condition, or payer source. Now, obviously, there is a little bit of... I can't think of the word I'm looking for here. I just blanked on you. There has to be a little bit of leeway in this because obviously somebody who is severely has severe dementia cannot be treated with to the same the same way as somebody with um, type 2 diabetes but they're fully cognizant so there is some difference but it's really more the dignity are you treating the person as an individual are you honoring their wishes um, independence they have to be allowed to choose what to wear to eat and how to spend time and this is where uh, it comes down from something we do uh, we do have to do nutritional assessments on people that are in facilities. 
we do have to offer nutritional, uh, beneficial MNT for uh, residents and facilities. But again, this is their home. And in the same way that you could tell somebody, you know, you should probably bump up your fruit and vegetable intake, they are free to take that advice and chuck it out. Same thing here. You know, we can do it. We, we can say it. We have to offer it. But if they choose not to do it, then they choose not to do it. They can choose their own care team, right? They have a dietitian, on, uh, a, maybe not on staff, but at least available. They have a social worker. They have a primary care physician. They have a, um, a well, the nursing team you're kind of stuck with. But so all of these individuals are available to the resident there. But they can go do their own. They can go to their, if they have a family GP that's still willing to see them, uh, the facility has to allow them to go to that individual instead. Uh, if they have a specialist they want to go see, or they haven't gone to see one but they would like to, the facility has to um, make that happen. And they can organize and participate in groups and activities inside and outside the facility. You can't prevent somebody from starting... I don't want to get too inflammatory here. Pick a thing that you would be shocked to learn about, and they, they have to be allowed to do that um, w within reason. They have to also be able to go outside the facility. The facility cannot hold somebody against their will, say they're not allowed to go do a thing. Um, yeah, so that's, you know, again, the same kind of freedoms that you have. Nobody can stop you from joining inflammatory group that you thought of a minute ago. Nobody can say you can't do that. Same thing with the with residents. And participate in their own care. Um, they are obligated to receive adequate and appropriate care. And again, if that sounds kind of shocking to you, just remember there was a time when people weren't doing that. Uh, they have to be informed of their diagnoses. They have to be able to participate in the assessment, the care plan, treatment, and discharge. They are involved in every step of the process. And just like everybody else, they have the right to refuse. They have the right to information. Um, this is one that's really emphasized a lot, and I know you've all heard of HIPAA. Same thing here. Uh, patients have a right to see and read their medical information. And uh, you may, and actually you have to, uh, answer any questions you can regarding their condition, treatment options, and likely outcomes. Uh, sometimes this leads to very uncomfortable conversations like, do you understand if you don't accept enteral nutrition, you are very likely to die from this? That comes up. And people do when they're older, uh, well, even when they're younger. But especially when they're older, there comes a point when people are just like, I, I don't care. And I've had that conversation more than once. So you have to be able, you have to answer the questions that they have about their medical condition fully to the best of your knowledge and honestly. So informed consent, I'm sure we've all done informed consent, but you know, let's just tick that box. Uh, it's a process in which a healthcare provider educates a patient about the risks, benefits, and alternatives of a given procedure or intervention. Um, it does say here, patient must be competent to make a decision by that, I mean that if they're going to make a decision on informed consent, they have to be able to be, they have to be able, they have to be competent to be able to make the decision. There we go. You still have to talk about it. You have that ethical and legal obligation to discuss this, whether or not they can make that decision themselves. This may fall to like the medical power of attorney to make that decision. You still have to discuss it with the patient. They have the right to refuse. Uh, all patients have the right to refuse any kind of treatment. And never forget that MNT is a treatment. It's a medical nutritional therapy. It, it is a treatment. Uh, if a patient is non, uh, that's not compliant, is it, you know, non-adherent is a more approved uh, terminology now, you attempt a counseling session, just like you with anybody else. Discuss with them, try to discuss with them at least, Find out what's going on, why they don't want to do it, um, and that's it's just like everybody else. I fe think sometimes people feel because they're in a facility or they're dealing with an older person that there's 
they should be able to do more and that's just not necessarily the case if you have done your due diligence you've tried to counsel somebody they reject that information or they choose not to act on it document that that you did that you did attempt it that they said no thanks and then honor their wishes all you can do is provide the information to them you cannot force anybody to follow it they have the right to privacy um and this is a little iffy right not iffy this is difficult in a facility in which people are having to provide like continent care for individuals or um surgical doing therapy or rehab for surgical procedures um but they have the right to as much privacy as can be provided to them. They also have a right about for privacy of who gets to know about them. We actually have had patients, the residents that had been in the facility that do not want people to know where they are. And then we had, well, back when we had physical charts, and kind of date myself there, we had a chart with just a room number and no name on it. There was no name outside the door. Um, if somebody called to ask about that person, you had to say, I'm not at liberty to discuss. So, yeah, <laughs> it, can, it can sound very weird at times. Uh, you do not have the authority, remember HIPAA again, you do not have the authority to discuss patient treatment unless the patient has given you permission or you are communicating with somebody who has been given that authority. So, again, it all comes back to the patient. It's HIPAA again. Do... Um, has a patient given you permission to discuss this or do you have somebody who has the authority to take that information? You ha they have the right to be secure in finances and possessions. They um, have the right to manage their personal finances or designate someone to do that. Now, the facility can be designated as the individual who is in charge of finances they can designate that person and the business office of the facility will handle a lot of the estate issues. But they don't have to. I mean, it can be themselves. It can be a family member. Remember, again, this is their home, so they're still getting bills. They're getting bank statements, things like that. So they may want to do it themselves. They have the right to be informed by what is covered by Medicare or Medicaid and how to apply. And I'm really not sure, even thinking about sinister evil facilities in the past. I don't know why they wouldn't want them to apply for Medicare and Medicaid, but we do have a process in all of the facilities I work in where they will walk someone through how to apply for Medicaid. And they have the right to bring and keep items from home. Now, I will say you can definitely, as a facility person, say, I really wouldn't recommend that you bring, you know, that grandma brings her um, 12 karat engagement ring you know, maybe keep that safe somewhere else. But if they want to bring it, they can bring it. As much as the facility can accommodate somebody's requests reasonably and safely, they have to. And the last one is representative rights. If a resident has been declared legally incompetent, they may designate representatives. Um, all rights transfer to the representative. So everything that we've discussed for the resident now applies to the representative. They have the uh, power to do something about the, to enact those rights or act on them. Now, the resident, unless they have been found incompetent, the resident may rescind those representative rights at any time. Um, and again, remember what I said earlier, at least in Texas, and I can speak for a couple of other states as well, New Mexico, Missouri, North Carolina are the ones I know from family. Uh, it is really, really hard to be declared completely incompetent. It's very difficult. It's very hard to have a setup where somebody is being held against their will. Um, good news, right? If you're there, it's very hard for like, again, one of those sinister movies where somebody sneaks in, takes away all of their... Um, it gets the will changed and has all, they, they bilk them out of all their money. Very hard to do that in Texas. Um, but so remember always like the, the important point of this, though, I kind of went off on a tangent there, is that uh, a representative has all of the rights and the authority of a resident if they have been designated so by the resident. 
All right, that was a very, very quick overview of rights. Again, no, no one's expecting you to be uh, like ace attorney at this. It's just important to be familiar and comfortable with them if you're working in, in uh, the geriatrics, especially in long-term care, because they are so important. All right, guys, that is rights. I'll catch you in the next one. Have a good one. Bye.